Last time the Detroit Lions went out and played against the Seattle Seahawks, the offense was in fine form. However, the defense has been anything but. And in this game that the Lions have coming against the Seahawks, it's personal for Aaron Glenn and the defense of the Detroit Lions. We're going to talk about it in today's episode, folks, so stay tuned. It started with an owner who had a last name fans despised, hiring a coach that the experts thought was crazy. But I got a plan, I swear to you. Who traded for a QB that was said to be washed up. They said the Detroit Lions would never amount to anything, that it would always be the same old Lions. But this team, our team, has a new identity. Defined and expressed by the crazy head coach. Doesn't matter if you have one ass cheek and three toes, I will beat your ass. Led by the QB that nobody thought was good. Motor City Mania is in full swing and ready to start. So join the show and be prepared for kneecap biting because Motor City Mania starts right now. Hello everyone, and welcome back to yet another episode of Motor City Mania, MCM. I'm your host, David T. Pike, and we're diving in right now. So, we just want to say welcome back, y'all, to the show. Thank you all for your view. Thank you all for your support. Thank you all for your patronage. God bless. Let's get into today's show. So, again, I just want to put this out really quickly. Again, since we are rebuilding, we are starting over again, please share this content, share this channel, share it any way you possibly can so we can keep moving forward and we can keep building this show so that way we can get it back to where it used to be. With having said that, we'll get into today's content. <clears throat> when you think about it, this game is huge for the Lions. Like, I, I'm going to say this right now. This game's huge. It may not be a playoff game. It may not be a game at the end of the year to determine who goes to the playoffs. But this game has huge, massive implications for the Detroit Lions. Like, I'm sorry. Like, this game is massive. And I'm going to explain why it's massive. And it's massive for a number of reasons. But when you think about it, as the Lions are getting set to go for their opener, their home opener against the Seattle Seahawks, like I said, there's a lot of significance on this game. There's an extreme amount of significance for both the team and for the fans. Because let's understand something here. Let's address, as they would say, the pink elephant in the, that's in the room. The last time that the Lions and the Seahawks played, NFL, the NFL and the fans of the NFL, particularly Seahawks fans and Lions fans, they were given an offensive just onslaught. There was just no shortage of points whatsoever when the Lions and Seahawks played last year. I think it was week four of 2022. And that was just an absolutely just crazy game. If I recall correctly, it was the highest uh, point scored game in the entirety of the 2022 season. Because in that game, the Lions and the Seahawks combined for 93 points as the Seahawks won 48-45. Now, I said that this game was extremely personal to the Lions. And it's extremely personal. It's extremely important to offense, uh, sorry, not offense, to defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn. And here's the reason why. We're going to kind of go through a little bit of a history lesson here. So let's think about this. <clears throat> I said last year, the Lions lost that game to the Seahawks 48-45. But if you take a look at that game much more in depth, it's even worse other than just the scoreline. Think about this, folks. When you take a look at that defensive output that the, that the Lions had last year, here's some stats for you. And I hate bringing up bad stats, but again, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to overlook it. You're always going to get the truth. You're always going to get an honest perspective on this channel. So here's what we can look at here from last year when the Lions played the Seahawks. 555 total yards of offense against the Lions defense, 320 passing yards, 235 rushing yards, 8.8 .8 yards per play, 9 out of 12 on third down, so 75%. They were 7.1 yards average a rush. They were 10.7 yards average per pass. They had a 76% completion rate. And the real kicker to this whole thing, the Lions defense never once forced a punt on the Seattle Seahawks offense. They never had to punt the ball one time in that game against us. Just an absolute just horrific, absolutely horrendous, just absolute stinker of a game from the Lions defense last year. Just absolutely horrible. And when you think about it, that was in the Lions home stadium last year. Now, I'm going to say this right now. That would be one thing if we were talking about how personal this game is for the Lions. Sorry, my paper was sticking there. But 
we have to go back even further here. Because I got another game for you. Because most of you have kind of forgotten about this one. But go back to the end of the 2021 season, back in around January. The Lions went up to Seattle, and we got our butts handed to us in that game, too, 51 to 29. If you realistically think about it, Aaron Glenn's defense has surrendered almost 100 points to the Seattle Seahawks between two of the between the last two outings that we played against the Seattle Seahawks. Because 51 and 48, that's 99 points. Over the last two times that, that Aaron Glenn's defense has gone up against the Seahawks, they've surrendered 99 total points. Yeah, this game is definitely personal for Aaron Glenn. It's definitely personal for this Detroit Lions defense because if, you were, if we were to probably add up all the points that the Lions have had scored against them from teams over the last two years, it would be far head, head and shoulders away. The Seattle Seahawks have scored the most points against the Lions. And I'm not saying that to be a, a smart kind of Alec person, but it's just like, dude, the Seahawks, for the last two times we played them, have had Aaron Glenn's number. So when you think about it, not only was the last game a massive embarrassment for the Lions defense, but it's just been a massive embarrassment whenever our defense has gone up against the Seattle Seahawks. So that game, it, that game, when you think about it also against the Seattle Seahawks we had last season, that was a defining reason of why the Lions started 1-6 last year. Our defense couldn't stop anyone. We couldn't stop a nose bleeding church. We couldn't stop a fart in church. We couldn't stop anything. Our defense was just that pathetic over the first seven games of the week, uh, first seven games of the season last year. But let's think about this in another way. That was then. Let's start getting into the now. After the second half of the 2022 season, which saw both steady but massive defensive improvements, not only in terms of play, in terms of the talent getting better, in terms of understanding the scheme better, now we have this franchise-altering win that the Lions had against the Chiefs last week on Thursday Night Football. And that was in Arrowhead. When you think about it, look at what the Lions defense did in that game against the Chiefs. They held the Chiefs offense with the best player in the game, the best quarterback in the game, to 20 points. That's impressive. You also don't allow that entire offense to go over 400 yards, which is an absolute regularity for that offense. So when you think about it, the Lions defense definitely answered the call. They definitely answered the bell being rung in terms of being able to step up and stop the Chiefs offense. But now we're talking about the past here. Now it's time for the Lions to step up and exercise some demons from the last two times that the Lions have played against the Seattle Seahawks. Like, I'm telling you this right now. The Seahawks are a team that the Lions have probably been looking forward to playing all offseason. Other than, you know, the opening night game against the Chiefs, this one is probably one that they've been looking forward to. They want to play the Seahawks because there is a lot of bad memories associated with us playing that team, whether it was at Ford Field or whether it was at freaking Se Seattle. So, we have two questions to answer in this, in this show really quickly. The first question I want to ask and answer is, what does this game mean for the Lions if they win? And second, how do the Lions win this game? So it's kind of like a, a kind of like we're gonna fo we're gonna follow a little bit of a pattern here, a little bit of a script here. So that's what we're going with. So let's answer the first question here. What does this game mean for the Lions if we win it? Well, we have to consider at least a couple of things here. Let's go back, shall we? Again, I I was originally trained to be a history teacher. I was originally trained to be a secondary education teacher. I wound up getting a history degree, so I do know what I'm talking about when it comes to history. History is something I'm very good at. Let's think about this really quickly. Go back to 2021. Go back to the 2021 playoff teams. If you go back and you take a look at all those teams, this is the teams that made it to the playoffs in the 2021 playoff race. That was the year that the Rams went and won the Super Bowl. So you had the Titans, the Chiefs, the Bills, the Bengals, the Raiders, the Patriots, the Steelers, Packers, Bucks, Cowboys, Rams, Cardinals, 49ers, Eagles. It's kind of funny how some of those teams have fallen so far from grace in two years, a.k.a. the Cardinals. But anyway, I, I digress. Let's consider this. That was the 2021 playoffs. In 2022, the Lions played six games against 2021 qualifying playoff teams. If you think about those teams, they played the Cowboys, the Bills, the Packers twice, the Eagles, and the Patriots. Against those teams that they that they played in 2021, they finished two and four with both of their wins coming against the Packers. They they lost all their other games against the Cowboys, the Bills, the Eagles, and the Patriots. Some of them in rather embarrassing fashion, such as with the Cowboys and the Patriots, and others in really tight knit close games, such as with the Bills and the Eagles. Now that's 2022. We had six games against playoff qualifying teams that year. 
Now we're talking about 2023. I took a look at the schedule. The Lions play eight games this year against playoff qualifying teams from 2022. Those teams are the Chiefs, who we just beat, the Seahawks, who we're about to play, the Bucks, the Ravens, the Chargers, the Vikings twice, and the Cowboys again. Now, here's why I'm bringing this up. If the Lions win against the Seahawks, they will have beaten two playoff teams in a row and had the first 2-0 start to their season since 2017. Um, yeah, that's pretty significant, folks. That's pretty damn significant. Because think about it this way, folks. When's the last time that somebody could probably find out when the Lions beat two playoff qualifying teams from the previous year in a row? That would take some looking into. But to think about it, we haven't had a 2-0 start to our season since 2017. Wait a minute here. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. That is six years since we've had a 2-0 start. So think about it. <clears throat> this game is very significant for the Lions for a lot of reasons, but particularly for this trio of reasons. It's a revenge game. The Lions have got revenge on their minds. I guarantee you they do. It's a fast start. Because if you can start the season 2-0, and you're already in a good spot as far as going into the later parts of the year. So there's that. And then it will show this, that the Lions are definitely the real deal. Now, a lot of people are going to probably want to contend with me, Dave, why do you mean that it would be showing that they're the real deal? Here's the reason why. <clears throat> I can already tell you this right now. A lot of people already take a look at the Lions and they think that they're the real deal, that they finally actually figured things out. But there's still a small majority of people that think that the Lions are still going to do something to kind of mess this up. And a lot of that comes from certain comments that have come out later on from other analysts and other people that are just like, hey, you know what? Great win that the Lions had against the Chiefs. But again, kind of like Mike Trurico said with that stupid asterisk comment, oh, the Lions didn't have to play against Travis Kelsey. They didn't have to play against Chris Jones. So they didn't actually play the Chiefs at full strength. Doesn't matter in my book. Again, a win is a win is a win. You go out, you beat the Super Bowl defending champions on their turf in one of the most hostile environments to away teams in the NFL. You still deserve the recognition of getting that win. So if you can beat two playoff qualifying teams, one of which was the Super Bowl defending champions, and get a 2-0 fast start to the start of the season... At that point, you've definitely shown you're the real deal. And at that point, you should shut up every freaking person that wants to say that the Lions are not the real deal. So that's why this game is very, very significant. It's very important to the Lions as far as what it means for the rest of the season. So that's what this mean that that's what this game would mean if the Lions were to win. Now, how do the Lions defense win against the Seattle Seahawks? Because I already talked about the offense. I actually talked about that in yesterday's episode. I'll put the link to that back up at the top. And it'll also be at the end of the show. But anyway, <clears throat> how do the Lions defense win against the Seahawks? Well, they need to do two things very, very well. They need to do two things very well for this for this team for this game to be won. The first thing they need to do is they have got to harass the ever-living crap out of Geno Smith. They've got to sack him. They've got to pressure him. They've got to make his day an unliving, uh, just a living holy hell back there because they've got to get after him. And the second thing they've got to do is they've got to shut down the run game. Now, that sounds pretty much like what any defense does, but that's very specific for what this Lions defense needs to do to the Seattle Seahawks offense. Let me tell you what I mean here. Making Geno Smith uncomfortable, harassing him, sacking him, pressuring him, whatever they have to do to get him off his game. Let's understand something here. Last year, Geno Smith kind of enjoyed a renaissance year because he was able to have an awesome game not only against the Lions, but also was also, was also able to have a really good season. Let me take you back to that game that, she had, that, that Geno Smith had against the Lions last year. He completed 76% of his passes for 320 yards, two passing touchdowns, and had a 132.6 passer rating. Yeah, the, Geno Smith had himself a game against us. However, that was last year. This year, the Seahawks are facing a lot of the similar problems that the Lions offense and Lions team in general had last year against the Seattle Seahawks. Injury. Think about it. Last time that the Lions played against the Seattle Seahawks, they were missing some rather big pieces. We didn't have DeAndre Swift playing in that game. We didn't have DJ Chark playing in that game. We didn't have Amon Ross St. Brown playing in that game. All those guys were major, major offensive components of our team, and we still wound up putting up 45 points. So, think about that. Now, when you think about it, what the, the Seahawks are having to deal with on their team, 
they also are missing some really big pieces, primarily their book and tackles. Starting right tackle Abraham Lucas was just placed on was just placed on injured reserve IR on Wednesday. And left tackle Charles Cross is considered a kind of a long shot to actually play the game because he has a toe injury. So when you think about it, the Seahawks don't have either of their bookend tackles. <clears throat> and furthermore, because they don't have those tackles, what did the Seahawks do? They go out and they sign a aging, they sign an aging but still Hall of Fame tackle in the name of Jason Peters. Jason Peters is 41 years old, folks. He can still play. But I'm sorry, Jason Peters is not going to suit up this weekend. If he does, I will be surprised. Much like how I was saying that Chris Jones and Travis Kelsey weren't going to suit up, I would be surprised on the same basis if Jason Peters shows it suits up. Because Jason Peters is not going to have enough time to understand the offense. And on top of that, he still has to get back into playing shape. And he hasn't been practicing or doing anything in months. So for me, it's like... The, the, the Seahawks are in a real dire strait when it comes to their offensive line protection for Sunday's game. And the reason why they're in dire straits is because we have to consider this. Aiden Hutchinson, folks. Why am I talking about Aiden Hutchinson? Well, let's think about this. Last week on Thursday, when the Lions went up against the, uh, up against the Chiefs, everybody who watched my old content or watched the game even will be able to tell you in an absolute instance that the Chiefs got away with practical murder on Thursday night football in terms of how their right tackle Juwan Taylor was excuse me was always getting a half a second early start on the snap count or he was so far back in the box that the crown of his helmet was not breaking the center's midline those are two clear rule violations, and all night Juwan Taylor got away with it, except for one call. All night he got away with it, which were then resulted in Aiden Hutchinson not having any sacks. But regardless of that point, Aiden Hutchinson still had a massive impact for our defense against freaking Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs offense. He had seven pressures in that game. He had a 20.5 pass win rush percentage. And he had five out of seven of his pressures on third or fourth down. Even though Hutchinson didn't get any sacks in that game, primarily because Juwan Taylor was cheating, he still was able to impact the Chiefs offense and Patrick Mahomes' ability to stand comfortable in the pocket. Now think about it this way, folks. I saw this somewhere on a Twitter account, and if I can find it, I'll put it here. But think about this. Both of the tackles that are in reserve, so the backup tackles for the Seahawks, when they came in to the game against the Rams for the Seahawks, if I recall correctly, they had 22 or something qualifying pass rush or pass plays, and I think almost half of the time that they were in pass protection, they were allowing pressure on Geno Smith. Almost half of the time out of 22 pass plays. I'm sorry. What that means to me is this Lions edge rushing unit is going to feast. Whether it's James Houston, whether it's Romeo Aquara, whether it's Aiden Hutchinson, they're going to feast. Because pretty much what it means is when your, when your offensive tackles cannot get any sort of decent protection for your quarterback from the edges and your edge rushers are your pass rushing specialists, your quarterback is going to be on his butt, on his back, all damn day long. And what it means is one of those guys or all three of those guys are going to feast. I'm telling you this right now. If I was Geno Smith, I'd be taking out life insurance policy because you're going to be getting hit a lot on Sunday. I can just see it happening right now. So what does that mean? If this happens, which I almost am willing to bet money that it's going to happen, Smith is going to be freaking rushed, which is going to be leading to incompletions. It's going to result in sacks. It's going to result in pressures. It's going to result in potential turnovers. And what do I mean by this? Well, when a quarterback gets rushed, when a quarterback gets pressured, they start trying to speed up their throws, which means they speed up their reads, which means there's a more likelihood chance of interceptions. And I'll tell you this right now, a pass coverage's best friend is a relentless and successful pass rush. But it's not just that as well. When a quarterback starts getting pressured in the pocket, they start getting antsy. They start getting happy feet. They start trying to find a way to escape, which also can lead to, to fumbles. So 
I realistically expect that the Lions defense is going to have a lot of fun against the Seattle Seahawks. This is a perfect revenge moment for them. So again, like I said, the edge rushers, Hutch, Romeo, Houston, and anybody else that's going to play on the edge or play kind of closer to the tackles and guards should have themselves a really, really good game. Such guys like Pascal, Levi, or Kaminsky, they all should have a lot of opportunities to get sacks because those bookend tackles for the Seahawks are not going to be there. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do apologize for all that because I am a little under the weather, but I'm not going to let that deter me from making content. Screw that. Anyway, <clears throat> that was point number one. <clears throat> point number two, shut down the run game. I'm going to say this right now. It's no secret that the Seahawks want to get the ball into the hand of, hands of Kenneth Walker, also known as K-9. It's also no secret that the Lions must overcome and exercise that embarrassing performance they had against the Seahawks last year when they gave up 235 rushing yards to the damn Seahawks. Now, let's understand something here. I fully expect that the Lions' front four, front five, whatever they're going to use as far as their defensive fronts for linemen, will be able to handle the Seattle Seahawks' uh, offensive line relatively well. But there's one other component in this whole thing that I really am expecting to have a big game. I'm expecting it to be his coming out party, so to speak. Jack Campbell. I'm telling you this right now. Anybody who's watched my channel or has seen my content in the past knows that Jack Campbell was my boy. When we were going through the draft process, I was so high on Jack Campbell because I'm like, listen, this guy is the best linebacker in the draft class. I said it repeatedly. And when we drafted him, I was ecstatic about the fact that the Lions went and got Jack Campbell because I'm like, we're getting a guy who can play pass coverage. We got a guy who is a tackling machine in the run game. We've got a guy who is a six foot five, 250 pound linebacker who is going to impose his will on opposing offenses. And that is exactly what we saw in the preseason. We didn't see a whole lot of it necessarily in the Chiefs game. He did have one really good pass breakup and a couple of decent tackles, but he didn't really show out a whole lot. I'm expecting that's going to be different this time around because, again, the Seahawks are going to try and run the ball a lot because they don't want to risk Geno Smith getting hit too many times. But if you go back to when Jack Campbell was in college, and again, in the preseason, we saw Jack Campbell's ability to be a stack -em up linebacker by constantly making run-stuffing defenses in both preseason and, again, back when he was in college. I'm telling you this right now. Jack Campbell, I expect, is going to have a big day on Sunday. I expect it. But I think all the linebackers are going to have a really big day. And I think all the linebackers really need to focus on shutting down those rushing lanes and force the Seahawks to get one-dimensional and start throwing the ball, giving edge rushers a chance to pressure or sack Geno. Again, if you can shut down the running game for the Seahawks, you're then going to have to force them to become one-dimensional, which is going to force them to have to throw a.k.a. Geno Smith, more chances to get sacks, more chances for turnovers, a.k.a. Lions win. The best way for the Lions to win this game is for the defense to shut down the Seahawks offense, get the ball back to the Lions offense so that way they can score and keep the Seahawks, as I said, one-dimensional. Make them have to throw the ball. I like our defensive secondary. I like what it was able to do against the Chiefs. I like the idea of being able to pressure Geno Smith, make him have to force throws, and our defense potentially getting more interceptions, whether it's Kirby Joseph, whether it's another one for Brian Branch, whether it's Cameron Sutton, whether it's C.J. Gardner, Gardner Johnson. All of those guys are going to be coming out. They're going to be playing hard. They're going to be playing fast. They've got vengeance on their mind. They've got revenge on their mind. Aaron Glenn is going to have that defense ready to rock and roll on Sunday. And I guarantee you this, Ford Field is going to be loud as ever live in hell. I guarantee you this, the Seattle Seahawks offense, they won't be able to hear themselves think, much let alone do anything else. So this game, like I said, very important, very crucial, high significance for the Lions because if they can win this game, they've got the ball rolling. They've got themselves an early win streak. They've proven the doubters wrong. And on top of that, they'll exercise some demons that the Seattle Seahawks have had against them for the last two years. So big, big, big game for the Lions. So I fully expect that we're going to see a lot of what we're going to see that I've described here happen on the field come Sunday, but we shall see for, for totality and reality. But with that having been said, I just want to say thank you all for watching in another episode of Motor City Mania, MCM.
If you like what you saw, by all means, I highly encourage you all to do one of these three things. Like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I also encourage you all, please, to do this. If by chance you subscribed to my previous couple of videos that I've already released, but you forgot to do so, make sure you turn that bell notification icon on so that way you never miss any content that I push out. Right now, more than ever, it's more important than I have people to keep coming back. I keep getting subscribers because of the fact that I'm having to rebuild. And again, I'm so thankful for all of you all that have already subscribed, but it would really help me out if not only you watch these videos all the way through to the end, but also you share my channel, share my content, so that way I can get back up and running as quickly as possible. And again, share this content with your Lions friends and family members, as I've already said. Share it here on YouTube. Share it on Twitter. Share it on Facebook. Let's help Motor City Mania get back to where it needs to be, so that way we can continue to have great content discussions with other Lions fans. And with that being said, folks, I just want to say thank you all once again for watching the show. Thank you all for your support. Thank you all for your view. Thank you all for your patronage. God bless. And until the next time we meet, I'll see you all in the next episode.